Brambrough back with Grand Tactician Civil War. CSA campaign in 1.09 beta. Robert Patterson's Department of Pennsylvania has led Joe Johnson on quite the merry chase through the Shenandoah Valley all the way down to Lynchburg. Patterson, however, has finally been brought to bay. Our Army of the Shenandoah, although somewhat outnumbered, intends to send the Yankees scuttling back north. First, however, some hard fighting must be done. And it must be done mostly by troops seeing their first combat on both sides. This struggle will not be a mismatch. Soldiers on both sides seeing the elephant for the first time. All right, before getting into the events of this episode, just want to point out another viewer unit has been recruited. Here we have the Styrian Panthers with a dark green jacket and white trousers. I've got them under the command of Joseph Wheeler. I think Wheeler ought to be a I think I think Wheeler ought to be a full bird colonel, huh? Let's do that. Uh, they're still small, right? Even recruiting at 500, they haven't even shown up yet. And then, <laughs> apparently attrition works on units even before they fully muster, right? They get sick on the way to their muster point because it's already down to 490. And, hey, mixed cav weapons is all I have. The, the idea is that uh, this is an Austrian-inspired uh, name. Styria is a region in Austria. and. Um, the idea is that these guys are riding the famous Le Panzer uh, stallions, which are all white. Uh, one, if, if one's ever seen the uh, 1970 movie Patton, toward the end of that movie, he's, you know, there's a kind of a horse indoor riding paddock or stable, and uh, Patton's riding a white stallion in there. It's a Le Panzer. Uh, well, I can, you know, I can change the uh, jacket and the trousers. I can't change the color of the horses. So eventually, when they show up on the tactical map, we're just going to have to imagine that their horses are all white. <laughs> okay. So, last episode, Patterson's Department of Pennsylvania led us on a merry chase of up the Shenandoah Valley, across here. It came down to Lynchburg. Gotta say, I'm kind of proud of old uh, A.I. Patterson. He's usually a little bit more uh, passive than that. So, nice job to him. But we've run him down, and we've got him in a siege battle here on the on the river. This would be the Upper James, uh, just north of Lynchburg, where, which he was trying to capture, and we caught him in time to prevent that. And now, the presence of those two extra brigades. Uh, Barto and McLaw should be here somewhere. Yeah, yeah, Barto and McLaws are here bringing our infantry up to almost 16,000. We are still outnumbered a little bit, infantry-wise. So, you know, this is not a... And a lot of these brigades are armed with smoothbores, including some mixed muskets. So this is not going to be a walkover battle by any stretch. But uh, it's time to send Robert Patterson back home. Because if we win this battle, it is an if. Um, if we win, he's got a long way to go to find his way back to a Union-owned IIP. All right, let's see what happens. Appomattox map, defensive situation. Here's our deployment zone here in the north. There's the objective. Here is the Union entry point, and so their deployment zone looks something like this, somewhat similar to ours, I would imagine. I don't see any other Union entry points on the edges of the map. 
There are no reinforcements for either side. And the relative size of the forces is... He's got a little bit more than we do. That's an estimate. That looks actually like a little bit bigger gap than I thought it was going to be. But that's all right. I think we'll be fine. And I'm just going to take the simple approach. We've got... Uh, it's kind of rolling through here. Uh, it's not quite as hilly as, say, like the Manassas map is in some places. And just to kind of eliminate the guesswork on where they're going to come from, I think we're just going to set up right here at the objective. He's going to want to come up this way. He's going to, you know, this is the main road coming in right through here. There's an alternate route through here. I guess there's kind of an alternate route over here. But bottom line, there, there's no, the road network doesn't really support him uh, making a really wide flanking move over here or over here. It, you know, not in the sense of he winds, you know, the AI winds up uh, kind of <laughs> fortuitously uh, flanking us simply because of the route that it takes, which I think is kind of what, I think that's kind of what happened to us in that uh, earlier battle. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to set up a defensive line kind of right in here, right in the edge of these woods with this open ground in front of us. You know, maybe make it a little bit uh, concave with some forces here and some forces right here in this edge of the woods. And just kind of cover it, cover this uh, open ground through here. I don't really have engineering points for much of a fortification, which is mildly disappointing because I, I did put the uh, the engineer perk on one of these brigades in here. I don't think it's all the way up to Engineering 3, though. So, in any case, I don't, I'm not going to have any parapets, but while we're waiting for them, we'll have the guys dig some more breath, you know, build some more breastworks in here. Pretty simple position here. Here's the objective, just like I talked about. Got a, I didn't come all the way up in here. That just looked like this flank was hanging out too much. But we got a shallow kind of concave position here. Any Federals approaching on our right flank will have some forest cover. I think that'll be all right, though. I, I, I like this better than angling up this way. That's just like inviting, oh, attack me here. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. Johnston has nine brigades. Four of them have seen combat. The other five, this is their first battle, and these are newly recruited units. We've got uh, Bartow in Walker's Brigade that's new with mixed muskets and McLaws in Jackson's not Walker's Brigade, Walker's Division and McLaws over in Jackson's Division with mixed muskets. And then Bonham's Division is entirely new. Um, so, and I think two of these are viewer units. We've got the Durham Light Infantry rifle armed in their first combat on the far left. There's Iverson in the middle with mixed muskets. And then we've got Mr. Beast Tigers, also rifle armed, here kind of in the center. On Bonham's right, but toward the center of the army. And all three of these brigades, first combat, so they all need to be building breastworks here toward their perk slot as we wait for Billy Yank to arrive. I used my few engineering points on breastworks for units which already have their Ace of Spades perk, and that's these in here. Got the Green Jacket Volunteers. The first Georgia Sharpshooters now properly in their olive green jackets with field green trousers. And the 82nd All-American holding down the far right. He's in position for the fall, uh, for the far right. McLaws Brigade needs to do some breastwork building, and I'm going to kind of 
have him make a refuse the flank uh, breastwork kind of like this. But he's uh, McLaws for now is basically a reserve until he gets uh, maybe some better weapons and it's not his first combat. But who knows how these things go. McLaws may find himself in the thick of it. That happens. And then we've got Bartow here. I don't know what kind of uniform I get. Sometimes the, a you know, you recruit a brigade and it's not just a standard, they're, you know, Confederate gray. Sometimes they'll randomly pick a pretty wild color scheme of their own. Looks like they've got white trousers. I don't think I picked that. I did do a wee little bit of parapet right here for the artillery. And then Barto's going to come up and build a breastworks a little bit in front of them. Okay, so uh, hopefully we'll not, and Mr. Beast will, or rather Loring, the Tigers here, will kind of do the same right here. B, this is our engineering unit. They've got the engineer perk. They're already at engineering three which is supposed to double the amount of engineering points available, which is, I was a little mildly disappointed that only had 10. I think I probably need to put an engineer officer in charge of this brigade. And he's going to build some more parapet back here solely for perk slot to get him up to his little, uh, Elite status flag. I'm just using the cab as for its morale buff. And she's going to sit back here, kind of somewhat near the artillery, and give a morale bonus to the units in this area. Not using it for scouting, really. And then I've got a, you know, skirmishers kind of fanned out across here. And that's, that's the main way that we're getting vision. And I think we have, I think the skirmishers have all the reasonable approach paths within sight all the way from this creek across here to this creek and slipping around this that slipping around further beyond what the skirms have in sight I, I just doesn't look viable for the ai to take those routes for patterson to take those routes okay that's offset of the position Okay, we've got some federal units beginning to come into view. There's a brigade sighted over here and another one over here. So they're taking uh, both of these routes in various forms. I think they're probably just coming here, marching toward the objective still. But uh, got these brigades through here kind of coming out of their extracurricular breastwork, busy work, and uh, manning this line through here. It's a little after 6 p.m. It's July, so sunset is going to be at 2100, 9 p.m. So we got about two and a half hours here, and the Federals are making an attack on our right. I think what I'm going to do is this brigade right here, B, I'm going to pull him off the breastworks, and I'm going to bring him back over here be in position to help uh, on the right flank. I'm moving Walker, the division commander, over to right about this spot near Jackson. He's going to have brigades uh, on both sides of Jackson. I think that'll do for now. Overnight, I may redeploy Bonham all the way over here see how this attack works out. What did I say earlier? McLaws may find himself in the thick of it. I think he's about to. Okay, these brigades are coming up in here, engaging our skirmishers that I put out. The Georgia Sharpshooters, McLaws Brigade, and the 82nd, patiently waiting behind their works to meet the federal assault.
right now it's showing minor defeat because they've driven in a few skirmishers that temporarily uh, gave us some route uh, debuffs, but those are clear. We're back to 0, 0.0 for routes, and the morale of both armies is surprisingly high. It's not that surprising for us, but given that they are in Virginia territory, I'm pretty surprised at the 68 uh, morale for the Federals. They're going to deliver a pretty strong assault here. Whether it's a coordinated one, well, we'll just have to see how Patterson does here. Go ahead and lay down these skirms. They've got Mississippis. I think they'll still have pretty good range, even laying down. Yeah, within range. Good. We'll take less casualties that way. B is starting to make his way over. It's going to be a while for him to get over here, though. He's got some woods to get through here. That never goes fast. Alright, I'm going to go ahead and pull the Georgia skirmishers in because now they're kind of blocking. <laughs> Wait, we need the full brigade able to fire. Laws here in the middle. He's only got mixed muskets. Let's go ahead and rotate uh, 82nd a little bit. Yeah. getting a little disturbing over here. It's about to happen. <laughs> Come on, B. Yeah, see, McLaws is just outranged here. So, you know what? He can't fire anyway. He, he's the focus of the fire. Let's go ahead and just lay him down. I'm not going to do that with, uh, well, yeah, Georgia sharpshooters remain standing so that they can fire. I think if I laid him down, it may be just out of range. Well, let's see. Let's see, if, let's see if he's still in range if they lay down. They are. I'll take less casualties that way, I hope. And we got more Federals coming, coming up the road here. Skirmishes over here delivers some flanking fire, even though they're just mixed muskets. Artillery is not really in a position to contribute at this particular location. We're a little bit ahead in the casualty ratio, but it's not enormous. 2.8% to 2.2%. Our army's a little smaller. So Patterson has an advantage when it comes to proportional casualties, percentage of force. I'm 
even when B gets over here, he's only got Springfield muskets himself. Causing some problems here. The McLaws is outranged. Can't really contribute fire. Hopefully, this flanking fire from Bartos to Tent will help with the uh, morale situation on this third brigade. Maybe. Well, he's not taking a flank. Yeah, he is taking a flank and debuff. He's turning to meet the skirmishers now. Tempted to it. Let's go ahead and do it. He'll still be in forest cover. Let's let's advance uh, the 82nd out of the works. Okay, this, this brigade is falling back. Skirms are kind of blocking 80 seconds field to fire now. I'm going to go ahead and pull them back in. Well, let's just, let's just pull them back out of the way. Do it that way. The skirmishers are a little bit more responsive under, under fire than they were. That's good. That's a recent change. I don't remember if that was 1.07 and 1.08, but that's a good thing. I think they're going to break anyway, though, before they <laughs> pull back, disengaged. The sharpshooter's kind of doing okay. The ball's kind of doing okay. Are they within their command? Uh, let's get Jackson a little closer. Laws has, has got the commander within range morale buff. The George sharpshooters do not. Now they do. Okay. Second is in position. Still has forest cover. So they're still getting use out of their perk. What if they're coming all hooking all the way back around here? That would be problematic. And with these forces over here, I'm not sure I want to pull Bonham's uh, division off the off the left flank. He's getting it. Okay. Need to rotate the sharpshooters. There we go. Okay, let's go ahead and bring Bonham up. This is your engaged brigade, Walker. Come on over here. Soon to be engaged, at any rate. Look at these guys. They are completely marching in this direction. So for the moment, they're exposing their flank. But it does make one wonder, what the hell are they up to? <laughs> um, you know what? Stuart, come over here. <laughs> Just to get eyes over here on what the... What the blasted Yankees are doing.
Okay, so this pre-dust action it isn't quite working out for the Federals. Um, we're at a thousand casualties inflicted to almost 600 taken. This is not a one-sided affair. But I don't believe that they're going to break and start withdrawing. There's going to be a fight on day two, I believe. Okay. B's engaged. He doesn't quite have forest cover here, I'm afraid. Okay, now they're rotating back. And facing us again. Third Brigade, wavering. That's good. Keep going, 82nd. You're doing good. First Georgia is taking some casualties here. be a little bit. Advance him up so that he's within... Oh, well. First Brigade is coming forward again. Advance forward just a little bit. Get within range. B. Off we go. Springfield muskets working. Once you're in range, you got good damage with those things. Okay. Let's advance uh, the All-American board again. on the 4th Brigade. He's not happening though. He, he's taking casualties at a high rate here. Cav isn't seeing anything over here. Come on up a little closer. I think there's unspotted Federals over here. And if there's not, I at least want to verify it. Exposing his damn flank here. Trying to get fire on the 4th Brigade, but he's exposing his flank to the 1st. Rotate him back around a little bit so he's not exposing his flank. Then, turn his damn initiative off so he doesn't rotate again. <laughs> Whether that works, I don't know. These guys are pretty much advancing right on. Georgia sharpshooters. I don't know if I like this. I'm kind of exposing the 82nd playing there to this guy, but I don't think they're really headed for uh, the 82nd. Is anything happening over here? No. Ooh, it's. Man, that's not looking good. Okay, McLaws, stand up. to rotate. I don't want you to actually move your position. There you go. Shit, it's rotating. I've got his initiative turned off, too. So, when they do this kind of crap, that doesn't have to do with initiative. That is another mechanic going. I mean, right? Now saw me turn it off. It's turned off. Yeah, it's turned off right now. It's not highlighted. He got himself broken. And that has nothing to do with initiative. Okay, we need to fall. Let's fall the sharpshooters back. Except they're facing the wrong way. 
Well, now they're going into melee. Okay. Well, they've sent that. Well, so they've broken this unit, but they're in melee now. Okay. They stopped. They're still in cover. Good. Okay. B's falling back to their division commander. Sharpshooter's still confident. They've taken a lot of losses, though. Now they're rotating to face 1st Brigade, which is pretty big. Okay, I want them to fall back. See, if you look at the, stop a second, if you look at the orientation of where the federal forces are, I don't know that this was really an intended attack, rather than these units were simply marching to their ordered positions, and it just happened to bring them within range of our line, and then they took over and started engaging. That's how I interpret that to have happened. And I think that's what a lot of the enemy's attacks, quote-unquote, are. They're moving into position for the intended attack, and it just happens to bring them within range of one of the flanks of the player's position. Okay, First Georgia falling back, as I want them to. They've taken 600 casualties. And morale is still fine. Okay, and then I want McLaws to advance into this position. move up the 82nd to about here. Okay. Some guys coming within range of our artillery. Sort of. One of our batteries is able to fire. The other is not. 12-pounder field guns for both of these. That's uh, John Pelham and Willie Pegram. These aren't viewer units, but those are viewer requested commanders <laughs> for artillery units somewhere. Which I probably would have put Pegram and Pelham in artillery command anyway. Okay, McLaws is now coming up, replacing the sharpshooters, who are still taking casualties. Laws is coming in range now. It's only got mixed muskets. <laughs> do what you can do, McLaws. You got the 82nd coming up to help you. Ew. Ew, ew, ew. Is that a detachment? No, that's a real artillery unit. Uh... Barto, put out some storms. Engage that artillery. In fact, let's, let's sneak, uh, sneak the cav back around over here. Finish out his uh, scouting mission on the flank. And if it's clear, 
Maybe he can go over there and rouse out that artillery as well. We're going to have sunset here in about 30 minutes regardless. Okay, and the clause is hotly engaged. About half of the 82nd is able to support. The 1st Brigade is taking quite a few casualties. McLaws has two, however... Oh, McLaws is almost... Bad. He's not in better shape than, than uh, the shark figures are. Fall back. Advance the 82nd toward this brigade. I don't know. I don't know if McLaws is going to make it. I think he's going to break here. Okay, we got something. We got things happening on the left and in the center now. Law is wavering. Hopefully, these skirms can can run over here out of range before this before this uh, tired brigade gets within range and engages them. <laughs> ah, my claws broke. Okay, let's let's move the sharpshooters up just enough so that they can support with fire. Ought to be enough right there. Maybe second is still getting credit for breastworks fire or breast breastworks cover. Twenty-three hundred to eighteen hundred. This is a pretty even uh, battle here. Twelve percent to eleven percent. I don't know. I don't know how this is going to turn out. Okay, Anderson is engaged again. 82nd is doing well, doing well. They haven't taken that many losses yet. <laughs> and the Skirms have a clear shot on this artillery now. That's good. That's good because right now they're firing into the rear of the 82nd. That's not helpful. They're taking that uh, under artillery fire buff. Debuff. What is this? Anxious about one leading commander being wounded. Well, Bartow's not wounded. Where's Walker? Is Walker wounded? Crap, he is. Walker's wounded. Now, that's not their division command. Uh, that, that's a different brigade. Okay, they're starting to get concerned about their cabin. Man, 900 casualties here. We need to advance the sharpshooters up a little bit more. Okay, these skirms are banging away at this artillery now. That's good. Forcing them back. Forcing them back. Is that clear? Yeah, that cleared the artillery fire on shelf because now this battery's like, uh oh, we gotta get out of here, so they're not firing at it anymore. That's a good thing. The brigade is falling back. As well they should, they've taken a thousand casualties. Alright. Bartow and the Green Jacket volunteers are engaged. 7th Brigade here. Do what you can, boys. This is 
Let's go ahead and pull these skirmishers back in. Here we've got uh, Mr. Beast Tigers starting to fire. Okay, that cab was kind of coming in here like they wanted to get at the artillery. Iverson drew him back. Okay, end of day. All right, it's the morning of day two, August 1st, 1861. I haven't really changed much. I've just kind of tightened the position a little bit, shortened, you know, fallen back from here, redeployed like so. And that's because we got a couple of, we're really kind of down to seven, really kind of like six and a half brigades <laughs> because, uh, you know, that now the router brigades have recovered their morale. B is back up to eager now. However, he, he really can't take any losses, right? He's just about at the end of his loss resilience. Plus, he's tired and still disorganized now. He's still showing the cut off morale debuff. However, that's where he was at at the end of yesterday. That that should clear pretty much immediately. And uh, Walker, of course, is still wounded, but he's moving this, his staff anyway. He's moving up into position. Jackson's division over here. 82nd is doing okay. So are the sharpshooters. However, they they don't have too much resilience left either. The Georgia sharpshooters are back up to eager, as are the 82nd. McLaws is up to confident. However, no loss resilience. Basically, as as soon as he gets shot at, those guys are going to break. And it's mixed muskets anyway. That's what I, you know. That's what I was saying. I needed to kind of shorten the lines a little bit, like like this, because McLaws is essentially out, and B is very close to the end of his tether as well. Due to breastwork building, B is an elite unit. Here's his little unique flag. I chose this one, the red one with the white stars. You can see it. Uh, you can see it flying there. But that comes from building breastworks, not from combat experience. He has a one-star unit, I think. Yes. Which, in August 1861, you know, one- and two-star units, that's about as veteran as it gets. So, 82nd and the Georgia Sharpshooters at uh, two stars. For August 1861, these are crack troops. What is this? Oh, those are the skirmishers. Let's, let's bring those back. Bartow. These are Bartow skirms. Let's just put them here. So that they could rejoin. And then the cab is over here. They had their own deployment zone because of where they were stationed. They're, they're going to come back over this way. Now, these are the positions where the Federals were at the end of yesterday. They may redeploy as well. So it could get real interesting here as soon as I hit play. And we've got the upper hand at the moment, but it's a fairly modest edge. It is a modest advantage. Um, let's get the tooltip here. Yeah, 3,400 casualties inflicted, but we have taken 2,400 ourselves. And you can see the percentages there. Almost 18% of the federal force, but almost 15% for us. It is not out of the question that we might run up, a, you know, things don't go quite right. We are not out of the woods for hitting that uh, withdrawal slash retreat threshold. So let's see what happens when we hit play now. Well, they pretty much stayed where they were. That's actually a good thing, I think. All right, let's bring this cap back back over here. I don't want him cut off. I think that artillery did route over here. Yes. 
The Skirmishers did that just before time expired. Let's bring this cab back up here. Yeah, look at that. Just just purely on loss resilience. My boss was like, well, I was confident, but I changed my mind. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> oh, I forgot to redeploy these skirmishers back in. They're headed back in to... Uh, Likes Brigade, the Durham Light Infantry. And here we go. Mixed muskets not quite in range. Damn it. Well, is this battery able to. Well, or either of them firing? I see smoke. Okay, Pelham is able to fire. And so is Peck. Yeah. They fire, and then while they're reloading, they flip back to idle, and then they fire again. It seems. That seems to happen a lot. So when you first click and get a snapshot, it may not be accurate. Okay, 82nd is engaged on this brigade. So are the Green Jacket Volunteers. I think they'll probably do fine in sending this brigade back. I don't know what these brigades are doing. I think they're waiting for these guys to show up, I think is what's happening. I guess. At least McClaws didn't run off the field. We'll give him that. Okay, this brigade is wavering. Clearly he's doing some good work. I think they're the ones who sent this first cavalry running. Because it wasn't Iverson, he wasn't in range. It's a good job, Willie and John there. They may actually be getting fairly close to withdrawing. Fairly close. Yeah. Yeah, they're, with they're withdrawing. And I'm just going to let them. I mean, we can't chase them anyway. And that means it's 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> and I've got all the time run until 2100 tonight. Uh, and that's fine because there are still clever, there are still several brigades through here that don't have their perk opened up yet. So we're just going to let them walk off, and we've got some more breastwork building to do. None of which needs to be shown on camera. Well, I thought that was a pretty interesting fight, and, and it was fairly close run. That was not uh, that was not a walkover. And Johnson's guys took some casualties here, had some rounded brigades. Um, and that's just kind of the way it's going to be at the beginning when you've got first combat units. And a lot of them have smooth bores. And, yeah. I think that battle went okay. Um, not the best ever. But that's just kind of how it is at this stage of the war. I'll be back with the results at the end of the day before the Federals withdraw. Well, we didn't have to wait all day. We actually, they actually reached the retreating threshold. There's only four minutes remaining. Okay, 30, about 3,500 casualties inflicted by us, 2,700 by the Union. Like I said, this was a f somewhat even fight, at least in terms of casualties. Jackson's division, of course, uh, inflicted the majority of that. And here we are, uh, just about even between the 82nd and the 1st Georgia. 
about 1,200 for the All-American and almost 1,100 for the first Georgia sharpshooters. And McLaws Brigade, limited, of course, by mixed muskets, it contributed, did 213, did not deal nearly as many casualties as he took there. 213 inflicted and 625 taken. 670 by the first Georgia. I kind of wish these two numbers would be on the same report, right? <laughs> like this consolidated combat report. There ought to be a column for casualties taken as well, instead of having to flip back and forth between the two to kind of get an idea of the uh, ratio. First Georgia sharpshooters still rated as the best brigade in this army with the 82nd, uh, number two, close behind. And they're both at two stars of experience now. Yeah, current status, eager, eager, engaged, engaged for the first and the 82nd routed and broken for McLaws. Okay, Walker's division also did some good work there. Quite a few casualties inflicted by the Green Jacket volunteers. That's a pretty good number for where they were and how much they were engaged, I think. And then, of course, Bonham's division was lightly engaged over on the left with uh, about even casualties to the extent that they were engaged, about even between Iverson and the Mr. Beast Tigers. And the Durham Light Infantry, under anybody you like, uh, really didn't fight. They managed to shoot six guys <laughs> from the edge there. <laughs> I'm sure that their turn will come. I'm kind of thinking... I'm kind of thinking maybe take one of these two uh, units and I may spread it out and, and take one of them and put them in one of the other divisions, kind of spread that uh, veterancy a little bit uh, wider, maybe. I don't know. And the artillery did about 90 casualties sitting here. And I think really they, they got some long-range shots on a few units back here, but I think they drove back that cavalry brigade as well. So nice job to these few guns. There's only four guns apiece in these two batteries. Okay. Well, this is showing 4,700 loss here. That, that They also took some losses from overnight attrition as well, but that is more than was shown in the HQ reports. Hopefully we got some good weapons out of this. I know I said that last time, and, said it, and then I forgot to look after we came out of the battle. All right, 2,400 rifles captured and three artillery. So hopefully there's some Springfield rifle muskets or maybe even some Mississippis in here. The Union starts with, the, with some Mississippis as well. Only 86 captured. And we don't have a prison camp yet. I, I kind of thought most of the stuff I had built was built. I guess that one is not. And oh, by the way, it happened again. This is not Stonewall Jackson, the division commander. This is the other Jackson, Henry Jackson, who is... Yep, you guessed it. The artillery guy picks up the fame buff there. <laughs> uh, I just laugh at that now. It's, I find it amusing. All right, let's look at the weapons. See if we got anything. That all looks the same. Yeah! Yeah, we've got 4,100 Springfield rifle muskets. That's enough for two more brigades, roughly. So I'll find a home for those. Guys like McLaws with his mixed muskets, I'm sure would appreciate that. That and we have some uh, 
we have some viewer units too. I'll tell you though, you know, I kind of talked at the beginning of the campaign about at least early, at least for the remainder of this year, my plan, we'll see what the union's take on it is. My plan is to do almost all of the fighting in Virginia. So I'm going to prioritize rifles going to Beauregard's and Johnston, Joe Johnston's and Magruder's forces. See if anything else jumps out here. Well, there's some Napoleons here. There's only nine, but that's enough now, I think, for another of these small pre-reform uh, battalions. And we've also got 4,800 Springfield Musket, which normally would be eh, whatever. However, in August 61, with the current weapons procurement mechanics, that's actually pretty significant. We've got mixed muskets brigades, so there's a few weapons there, too. They're not any better range, but they have higher damage than mixed muskets. That's what's good about the Springfield smoothbores. I think they're also pretty good for melee as well. It's not shown in the tooltip, but they have a bayonet. Whereas I'm not 100% sure that mixed... Yeah, miss. Yeah, mixed muskets isn't just about the damage of the weapon. It's also the Springfield has a bayonet and the mixed muskets. Well, here you go. You get a kitchen knife. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> okay. All right. And then right here at the tail end, I'm going to talk a little bit about something because it has come up. Right? We have some projects now available to include cast artillery, which we talked about. Uh, reboard muskets is available. Uh, we could go recruitment offices. Well, let's just open the... Okay. So, in episode one, I talked about my plan for the projects and how I wanted to limit uh, the number of weapons projects that I take so that I can get to other military projects like organization reform and logistics um, so that I can get to those earlier. And there was a comment about that. Saying, it, it, bottom line is uh, it, I haven't really experienced yet the the new weapons procurement situation as of 1.08. I, I kind of understand that the early orders take a really long time and you have to wait for standardization to build up, right? And so up till now in 106 and 107, basically you unlock your project and then you could just plop down a 50,000 weapon order and it would take a while it would take about four maybe five uh, almost six months but they would come it, you can't do that anymore right when you first unlock one of these projects if you plop down a fifty thousand weapon order it'll take years literally like hundreds upon hundreds of days that matter of fact we'll we'll, we'll just show it because of that, I think, in the point that the commenter made, and I think it's valid, is if 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 I limit myself to only one or two rifles, you know, infantry rifles, they're coming so slow that it'll just completely backfire. Kind of need to open up more sources of rifles because the early orders for these things are going to be pretty small. So I, I've kind of rethought that. And yeah, I'm going to take several, at, at least when it comes to infantry rifles. At least for those, I, I think I need to open up some more sources. Because of that, yeah, I'm, I'm still going to take the Confederate rifles. 
Okay, that plan hasn't changed. But I I think the rebores and the legacy rifles, I, I think I need to do those. The rebores aren't great, but at least they have a 400-yard range. And the biggest problem with the smoothbore muskets is the range. The accuracy is poor as well, but being completely outranged and not even able to return fire, that's really where the musket arm troops have the most problems. So I'm going to take the rebore muskets. There we go. Okay. And then just to kind of show what I was talking about there. Well, and to see for myself as well. All right. We didn't get into this in the last uh, campaign because I did all my weapons procurement before that change came. So right now, 80, 82 days for a thousand, just for a thousand. Let's, let's just see what the, yeah, there you go. 577 days to make the biggest order. That is about a year and a half, roughly. Over a year and a half. So that's untenable, right? We order these today. They're going to come during the winter of 1862-1863. Can't do that. So we got to start with small orders. Now, if I just order a thousand, it's going to take almost three months. And it won't even be enough for a 1,500-man brigade. I'm going to at least order enough for one brigade. So I'm going to go ahead and take the 2,000-piece order. That may not be the best idea. I mean, that adds another almost a month. And that's what I'm going to do. So these are not going, you know, so one brigade's worth of reboards are going to come September in December. There we go. So you can kind of see that this whole thing has been retuned so that the weapons don't really start coming until later in 1862. The days of having an all-rifle armed army before the end of 1861, those, that, that's, those days are over. There's going to be a lot more smoothbores in the army for a lot longer time, and that's just the way it is. And we can't e and we can't even order uh, or produce Springfields. So there's going to be mixed muskets in the army. There's that's just the way it is. But we did capture some. I'll get I'll get those Springfield rifle muskets put out. I'll get those Springfield smoothbores put out. So the next question is, to where is Patterson going to retreat? There are not a lot of good options for him real close. I think he might retreat over here to Hampton Port. That may actually be the closest Union Hill IP. He may retreat up to Grafton, Cumberland, or just head back to Washington, D.C. But he's going to be in retreat mode. He can't do anything along the way. It'll look annoying. Right? Is he's tromping across Virginia or something. But he can't do anything until he gets to his destination. When those weird retreat paths happen, they look worse than they really are. Kind of like we saw up here, right? Where, uh, in, you know, in the last episode, where Johnston was squarely in Patterson's way up here, but he was in retreat mode and so had no effect on Patterson's movement. In any case, I think that that will do for this episode, and we'll find out where Patterson goes next time around. If you like what we're doing with the channel, then leave a like, leave a comment, maybe even subscribe. If you're new to the series or to the channel and would like to catch other episodes in this series that you may not have seen, 
I'm linking the playlist here. At any rate, thank you very much for watching. I appreciate it.